Well, hello everyone. This is Jason Cisco, and we are live on a beautiful Wednesday. And we welcome you to another edition of our High Noon Prayer Broadcast. High Noon has taken on its own identity as we have begun praying at the noon hour. But we know that there are people that are watching at all different time zones. And you are watching all over the world. So we know that this is more than just a time zone or an idea of keeping watch um, of what time of day it is. It is much more a prophetic idea and a concept of what God is doing with us. That regardless of how we feel and regardless of where we might be uh, in that uh, spectrum of spiritual development or effectiveness or cycle of an organization or a church, or you know, you might be an old, uh, you know, kind of uh, well-established organization that we're speaking to, or it might be something very new and very fresh that's just getting going. But the idea that God is always at high noon. Every good gift, and we say this every day, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we welcome our church triumphant family. I saw many of you uh, joining with us. God bless you. Some that cannot even come at this point uh, into an in-person service, this is here for you to help you pray and to stay connected and to feel that you are alive in the body of Christ. We love you. And for those of you that connect with us outside of our Church Triumphant organization, this is the reach of our global arm, which is Triumph Ministries International Network. And this is established as a means for us to work together as the global church. And that global mentality, that global understanding of what God is doing, that filters down, it flows down into the tributaries of all the local churches and all the local uh, 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 families that are connecting with God, whether that's here in Harris County or whether uh, just as Maine just jumped in with us or South Africa uh, jumping in with us right now. It is, it is always uh, a joy. Amen. From Norway, God bless you. Uh, California. So we're seeing people from literally all over the world that are connecting with us today. We love you. Thank you so much for staying in the fight, for being strong, for being focused, for being dedicated, for being committed. I was walking and praying today and I was just thanking God for so many people uh, that are so faithful, can, can just continuing uh, continuing to just uh, uh, be with me every day and, and um, uh, together we're we're moving forward in the body of Christ. So it's my uh, it's it's my role to help drive uh, focus or attention towards a desired result. So let's think about what are those results and what does God want to do with us today. And I kind of gave our title as as our focus today is how to be our best, being our best while we are preparing for the worst. So let's start by just getting ourselves in alignment with God again. It's something that it should be a daily discipline in our lives. And I do know that you are doing this. Many of you are doing this, whether I do it or not. You are doing this. I've taught you. We've talked about it. But for those that are new and are just stepping in, and it also helps us just uh, with this particular broadcast to make sure it is always showing the priority towards uh, submission to God. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and what? He will flee from you. So let's pray. Father, we come to you today, and we just say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, be your name. Everyone say that. Just say, he's my father. Just say that out loud. He's my father. And he always gets it right. He is always perfect. You are the best. You are the greatest. There's none that's like you. May your name, may your reputation, oh God, may your, uh, may, may, may your identity, who you are, may that spread to the four corners of the earth. May the heavens and the earth celebrate and declare it. May all the demons in hell tremble and shake before it. At the name of Jesus, at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. And at the name of Jesus, every tongue must confess and shall confess that Jesus Christ, that Yeshua HaMashiach is Adonai, is Lord he is the Lord. You are the sovereign God of the universe, and we give you praise today. We thank our, our shalom, our peace. You are our Sidkanu. You are our Emkadesh. 
You are our holiness and our righteousness. Father, we thank you that you are the provision for every part of us. I thank you that it touches us both physically and spiritually, both mentally and emotionally. You guide our steps. You order our stops. We bless your name today and we thank you, Lord. Now we submit ourselves as a living sacrifice, spirit and soul and body. I want you to pray with me right now that God will help you to walk in God consciousness. We walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Father, right now, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We want to be joined with you. We want to be one with you. We want that oneness. We want to ascend into that highest dimension of total surrender, of complete commitment, of the whole, uh, the whole sacrifice, not just, not just a, a sin offering, but, but, but the whole burnt offering sacrifice, not just coming and asking you for, for forgiveness, but offering our whole selves unto you. And as First Thessalonians says, Father, we want to be sanctified uh, wholly, completely. We want to be sanctified completely, spirit, soul, and body. And so, Lord, we bless your name today, and we thank you, Lord, that we are one with you. We are one with you. I want you just to yield to the Holy Ghost and worship just for a minute right now. Just in your own way, just lift your hands to him, lift your voice to him. Tell him that you love him. Tell him that you adore him. Say something very personal to him right now in this moment. Father, we just, we adore you. We love you, Father. We thank you. If I could see your feet that were pierced through with the nail, I would kiss them. If I could reach my hand to your side as Thomas did and feel the authenticity of where, where the, the spear went in, what, uh, what delight that would be to my soul and yet how powerful it would be in impacting. Father, if I could see the nail prints in your hands or the scars on your face, if I could look upon you and see all of that, I would know even more what, what my, my heart has, has come to understand of how much you love me, but I thank you. And even though I cannot see you now, I will. I will. I see through a glass darkly, but now, now, just now, I see in part and know in part, but then I'm gonna see you face to face and I'm gonna know you. And I'm gonna be known even as I am known. Hallelujah. I shall know him. I shall know him when redeemed. By his side I shall stand, I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness to us. I, I want us to pray now through the four ones. Uh, this is a part of our alignment, and then we will continue on from spirit to soul to body, okay? The four ones. We want to be in the center of one God. Not just that you will be in the center of us, Father, but we want to abide in the center of our consciousness with you. We want to be in the center of your world, your life. Everything exists for you and it was made by you. And all things hold together because of you. And so, Lord, we want to have the full benefit of the life that is in you, that eternal life that John said that they handled, that they looked upon, that they heard, uh, that they had fellowship with. And our fellowship is truly with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We want that fellowship in the light. And so, Lord, we come to you today and we ask you that you would help us to come into that divine center. We pray, Lord, that we would have the one emotion of love, that your perfect love would be in us, Lord Jesus, that we would be delivered from all fear, for perfect love casts out fear. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that that perfect love helps us to know, oh God, what truth is, because love is surrounded and protected by truth. And so, Father, I pray that love and truth would hold hands and be, oh God, a protectorate of our hearts, oh God, and the motivation of your love would be every action, every thought, and every response. In Jesus' name, we are praying that we would stand in the full focus of this moment, in the eternal now and the infinite here in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Everybody say in Jesus' name. I just want you to say this as a confession. We've prayed it many times, but I want you to say, thank you, Father, that I have access to the gifts of the Spirit and to the fruit of the Spirit. I want you to say, thank you, Lord. I am clothed with the armor of God on the right hand and on the left. It is the armor of light. 
It is the armor of God. And I take it upon me today in Jesus' name. I want you to say I have the seven spirits of God as the counsel of God. The whole counsel of his will is mine. The spirit of the Lord, which is mastery, wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. I am aligned in the body. I am aligned with the head. And we are one with each other in this dimension of perfect symphony, perfect agreement. Now, anything is possible. I want you to say that with me. Say anything is possible right now. I am releasing faith to you in Jesus' name. I am releasing confidence to you certainty I am releasing to you today. I'm unlocking more blessings and more potential in your life as you continue to walk in obedience to the Lord. But I want to speak to you a little bit today about the book of Judges, and I want to help you with your uh, effectiveness in prayer. I've been talking to you as seals, as, as special forces of God, and so I want to kind of go back into that. We have talked about this before, but I want to enhance it just a little bit more today for those that need a refresher and for those that have never heard this before. In Judges chapter number three, uh, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, as many as as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Every generation must learn how to war. Every generation has things that God leaves. Why did God allow that? Why is God allowing my adversary? Why, did, why is this corruption uh, in the world today? I'm going to tell you something. There's been corrupt people ever since the fall of man. There was so much corruption, even in the days of which those that could still point back to having personal contact with Adam uh, in the days of Noah, there were still corrupt people. Matter of fact, there was so much evil and so much imagination of everyone against God that God said, I, I wish I wouldn't have even made man. That's how much corruption there was. So to say that, well, God, why are you allowing this? This is the freedom of man's will. God will not force us to serve him. He will not make us obey him. He could, but he won't because he's a loving God. He gives us opportunity. He does tell us that there are consequences. The wages of sin is death. He does tell us that. It, be not deceived. God is not mocked. You cannot mock his laws and, and get away with it. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. So there is consequences, but God does not force us. God does not force us to serve him. And so he says here in Judges chapter three, there's a generation that's not skilled in war. And he said, every generation that, that, that serves me is going to have to deal with adversaries and they're going to have to be skilled in war. And he said, so these are the nations that I've chosen to, to keep here to prove them. And so God has certain obstacles, certain things. And, and as my dad taught so many years ago, he talked about the, the various Indian tribes when the, when, uh, the um, immigrants were coming in, the first settlers were coming in, they were meeting them and, and they were seeing all of these uh, inter- uh, tribal wars that were going on, and there was a um, you know a certain uh, captain that had gotten in with one of the Indian uh, warriors, and and he said, "What well, what about the these tribes that you have? Aren't you tired of fighting them?" And he says, "They are my beloved enemy." He said, "Because if they were not there, we would be lazy, we would not be motivated, we would not be skilled, we we would not train, uh, we would not study." We would not learn how to work together. He said, they are our beloved enemy. And so God, sometimes if we are not motivated, if we cannot get it done when everything is for us or with us or, uh, or the environment is, is really, really very, uh, uh, very simple for us to, to navigate, uh, if we can't get it then, then sometimes God has to wake up an adversary. He has to leave something in our wake that really makes us tremble, that really is a challenge to us. And we're looking into right now the future uh, of, of, of just the direction of our country right now, the direction of this generation, what we're seeing on the global stage, uh, the Antichrist system, the global uh, elites, and all of their strategies that are coming together right now. Uh, the United Nations has already reignited uh, its full um, connections. You know, the WHO is now reconnected uh, with the United States. And, and we're seeing all of this now with the new administration coming in that, that they're kind of trying to undo all of the nationalism and go more uh, towards that globalism, of, you know, global warming and all of these different trends that they're out there that they have been uh, filling the universities with. 
uh, and they're calling it science, but folks, when you really get down to it, uh, it's a religion. Uh, it's, it's a religion too. Uh, so, uh, and, it, and it's an agenda that they're, they're working on. This great reset, making everybody go green, is also a way of changing the economy and taking full control of the economy. We see all of this, and folks, uh, these are very powerful forces. Uh, these are these these people. Many of them, uh, as they're getting more power and they're getting uh, more laws that they're going to get passed, and all these executive orders being issued and funding uh, for all of their different areas. You know, I, I realize that it's going to become more and more toxic. It's going to get more and more uh, anti uh, uh, anti Christian in the world. Uh, and so we know that perilous times are coming. That's what the Bible very plainly says. But at the same time. At the same time, isn't this, isn't this leaving these nations or leaving this opposition, uh, isn't this going to pull out something in us? And what I'm saying is that God is going to release his best blessings in the worst times. And he's going to bring you into the highest level of faith. He's going to push all of us into a dimension of, of, of operating at our best and our highest selves. That God has a strategy and a plan. He has a will for all of us. And his ultimate goal is not that we would uh, live a life that is uh, void of all offense or void of all um, adversity or that we will never go through a trial. But God's goal for us is that we would be the best that we could possibly be so that we could be the most fruitful, so that we could reach the most people, so we could have the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So the promises of God for the last days are so incredibly huge that the vision is so vast. It's just staggering. But at the same time, the opposition can be overwhelming. And so what does that mean? Put it all together. What does that mean? In the time when, when things are the worst, that's when God does his best work. And guess who he's chosen? He's chosen you. <laughs> he's chosen me. So we have to learn how to just rest in that and understand that and know what God wants us to pray about, what we can control, what he wants us to know, and what he doesn't want us to know, and where he wants us to put our primary focus. That's a big thing. Where should we be spending our energy? So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you a little bit about equipping, uh, equipping us for this, uh, this next level. And as we go to the next level, it's going to be more and more essential for the gifts of the Spirit to operate in our lives. It's going to be more and more necessary for you to hear God, not even, not even every week, but every day. And it's going to come to a point where it's going to be moment by moment, you're going to, be able, you're going to have to be able to think very quickly and be able to know what to say or what not to say or how to respond. And so we are being trained. We are being developed. God is trying to get us uh, in, our, in this spiritual gym uh, of weightlifting right now. The Sister Claudette Walker had that really specific word about we're building up our spiritual strength and muscles. And what this comes down to is learning what battles that we want to fight. Because it's not always just about the battle. It's ultimately about winning the war. And so sometimes I avoid lesser battles because those battles are not really the, the most direct route for winning the war. And that is being strategic. This is the reason why Ecclesiastes says, wisdom is better than weapons. Having wisdom helps me to know how to build a strategy to win. So the wisdom of God, for example, said, march around those walls seven times. On the seventh day, march seven times because he understood the power of vibration, the power of unity in lockstep, and he also knew the power of sound. And from that, together with the angels that were with them, there was a heavenly strategy that was working together with an earthly uh, obedience of a pattern. And so God put those two together and the walls just disintegrated and literally fell down. And so God knows how to move things very fast. He knows how to do a quick work in the earth. And so this is what we want. We want to be able to, instead of saying, well, our way would be to siege them and it could be, you know, could be two, three, four years before you win Jericho. Well, people start losing a lot of energy and a lot of motivation when you're just kind of stuck in one spot. And this is what I felt in the Holy Ghost. And as I was talking about yesterday, God is removing those stops. 
He's getting us over those, those barriers and, and stepping into a whole new flows of, of thinking where we're, we're, we're taking Canaan land and it's, it's happening fast. This is what God wants. So I want to show you how quickly God can turn the battle, how quickly God can move us when we operate in that strategic anointing that wisdom gives us. Wisdom and understanding, remember, mastery, lordship, and then the spirit of the Lord is upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. So that's first. That's for wisdom, understanding becomes, uh, comes before, uh, before might. And even counsel comes before might. So wisdom, understanding, counsel, and then we go into might, and that's the power of war. And so as we are going into this next season of warfare, we are calibrating right now. God says to me, uh, today, this is about strategy, getting our strategies right and being prepared. The, the war is not over. The war is getting stronger. It's getting bigger. Uh, that We're going to have more storms. There's going to be more adversity. There's going to be more issues right now. Things are, are just relaxed for the moment. And so when they are, we have to go. When we feel favor, when God is working with us, when there's no obstacles, that is not the time to rest. That's the time to get your strategy together. It's time to be vigilant. It's time to have critical thinking. It's time to build our momentum so that when there is something uh, that gets in our way, we can plow right through it very easily. They talk about how difficult it is for an engine of a, of a train to get started. The initial movement to get from zero to five miles an hour, the amount of energy that it takes is absolutely massive. But once that train with all of those uh, with all those cars behind, it could be hundreds of cars and the amount of weight that is now being carried uh, once that they say that, uh, that, that it could, it could plow through 20 feet of wall when it's going uh, 70 miles an hour, that the, the momentum is so powerful. It could go through 20 miles, 20, 20, uh, 20 feet of wall. So it was something along those lines. And so what I'm saying to you is that massive things can be plowed down when our momentum is strong. And this is what God is doing. He's shifting us now. He's getting us off of the defense and off the exhaustion. He's recalibrating us. He's repositioning us. And he is saying the overflow is coming. I'm pouring out the prayers now. And it was a strategic work. It's, it's strategy. God has a strategy that he is putting into motion here. And so he tells us in Judges 3, the strategy that he has up front. He said, look, he said, look, I left some nations there to prove you. Verse 2, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing. So God is saying there's a lot of people that really have gaps and they don't know. I, I was talking to the Lord about this today. I say a lot of the same things. But I realized that what is common knowledge to me, these are things that I was trained on, I was developed in, I was mentored on, and I had a constant stream of that. But I think also about, about some of my mentors, they would say the same things to me over and over and over again. Because folks, until it becomes a part of your lifestyle, you might have some knowledge of it, but we have to learn how to build a culture that reflects this leanness, this, this efficiency, this unity, this flexibility, this hearing from God and breaking out of these stodgy, heavy, uh, bureaucratic environments of churches that are really out of touch. We have to make the shift. We have to move. And so there is, there is shifting that is going on in the spirit right now. I want you to stop and lift your hands. I know it's a lot of flow right there. Stop and lift your hands to the Lord. And let's say in Jesus' name, I'm going to step into this. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we are stepping into it. We are building an apostolic culture. We are building a movement of intercessors. We are building a movement, oh God, of, of churches, oh God, of, of, of organizations, Lord Jesus, of people that are affiliated together. There are some that are in organizations and some that are building their own small little organizations. And Father, these networks are powerful and they're, you're aligning them. There are circles, oh God, of influence that are coming together, apostles that you are bringing together and their networks are gonna join with other networks. I thank you, Father, for it. But we have got to build it. We have got to speak it. We have got to be it. And I thank you, Father, for that wisdom and for that divine flow. I thank you, Lord, for Church Triumphant, that we are going to make the adjustments. We are going to make the shift. I thank you, Father, 
Father, that you're going to help us to push off from the great foundation that we have. But it will not, that, 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 that monument that's built to where we've come from is not something that will keep us limited, but it will create a movement. That the monument to what you have already done is supposed to facilitate a movement forward to take the land and to possess our divine inheritance in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Do you feel that witness of what I'm saying today? Is it resonating in you? All right, clap your hands to the Lord. Give me a thumbs up or a heart or something and let me know that you're feeling that resonating in you today. Amen. God bless you. All right, so let's go on. Now, the first judge was Othniel, and then it came to Ehud. Now, verse number 12, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. God strengthened that enemy. He said, this is the one that you need because your enemy becomes, the, uh, becomes a reflection of your gap. Your enemy is a reflection of the area not submitted. Your enemy is a direct look in the mirror to the sins that you have done or the ways that you have missed the mark. And so he strengthens Eglon. He said, you're not listening to the prophets. You're not obeying my word. You're not following the path of what you've been taught. So you know what? You can't have the internal. You're not listening to me internally. So I'll get your attention externally. I will create an external problem. So he strengthens Eglon. Now, Eglon was a very extremely obese man. I would estimate it would be somewhere in the four to 500 pounds. And the reason why I say that is because the dagger that was put in him was 18 inches minus the half, the heft. And the Bible says when he put it in, the fat closed over the top of it. So you have to think how big around is the guy uh, that, that a dagger uh, goes in that's that long, 18 inches long, uh, plus another four inch. I mean, this is two, two and a half feet. I mean, you know, whoa, you know, uh, going into this guy. And so... Uh, and it just closed up around him. It says it, uh, it, it says it, um, it, it explains uh, this about, about Eglon in just a moment here. It explains how, how big he is. But verse 17, he brought a present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. That's what it says. But what we see is that there was a judge that God raised up to deal with this man. He was an expression of, of flesh out of control. That's what he was expression of. And so he's saying, Israel, you are out of control. You are, you are flesh out of control. The Bible says he smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. This is Jericho. So he takes their initial victory, the representation of God's first city that they took in Canaan land. This was also the tithe. There were 10 major cities that they, that they won. And that's why I said you can't have the gold or the silver or anything out of it. It's all mine. The next cities, you can have the gold and silver, but not Jericho. Now he takes this original stronghold that was dedicated to God uh, because they had lost their divine priority. God was not first in their life. So they lost that stronghold. And, and palm trees, it was the city of palm trees. What is a palm tree? A palm tree can handle the wind because it bends. It has a flexibility about it. It has a bendability about it. And this is, palm tree is an expression of our yielding to God, our submission to God, is that as the wind blows, we're very easily moved by it. And so the enemy took, took that city because they were no longer bendable and flexible. They were not bowing down. They were not submissive. And so when you lose that nimbleness, you are vulnerable. Flesh is, is hardens itself against God. Uh, the flesh is carnal, resistant, uh, but here the Bible says something happened. So the children of Israel served them for 18 years. Verse 15, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. It took them 18 years to say, I've had enough. How long is it going to take for America? How long is it going to take for us? How long does it take for a church to say, you know what? I've had enough. I can't deal with this anymore. My flesh is out of control. I'm tired of being a captive. I'm tired of being oppressed. I'm tired of the enemy taking away my, uh, my, my, my priority for God. And you know what? We need a deliverer. We need help. God is wanting to release that deliverance and that exceptionalism. So God has an answer. God always has an answer. And I want you to tell you, for whatever's going on in the world today, God has an answer. Is it you? Is it me? Is it us? Are we the generation? Are we the people that God is saying, I'm going to show you how to do it 
my way. I'm going to turn a miracle around. I'm going to turn the West around. There's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit in the West, and it's going to flow all the way into the East. God is going to do it. It's going to happen. But someone has to first realize we need it. We have to shake it off and say, God, we need help. Oh my goodness, send us a deliverer. So look who God sends to them. He sends a Benjamite, a man who is left-handed. Now we know this from just simple science that left-handed people tend to be more in the right lobe of the brain, which is the creative intuitive. If you use the right hand more, you tend to be more on the left brain, which is more logic and analytical. The majority of people come from the right side. And so when they tested him, when, they, uh, when he came in to bring the present, they searched him for weapons, but they searched his right leg because they assumed he was right-handed because most everyone is. But instead, he was left-handed, so he was able to conceal a weapon on his left leg. So this man must have been a man of some stature because he has a dagger that's 18 inches uh, on that leg. That's a pretty long, uh, that's a pretty long leg, a uh, femur for it to be strapped on the leg. It's not on his side because they could see it if it was on his side. So this thing was strapped to his leg. So he had someone with some reach, in other words, someone with some height. And he has someone coming from a new perspective and he's in his right mind. If we are going to win, we have to be in our right mind. We have to extend our reach. We have to have some strategy about what we do. And this is where we see the wisdom in operation. Watch this. The Bible says he was a man left-handed and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon. So they, this was their way of proving that they were in submission to Eglon is that they would bring tribute money. And so in other words, uh, the bullies come in and say, if you don't give us so much money, we're going to kill you. Uh, and we've already taken over your city. So you know what? We're going to start cut, cutting off fingers and hands and toes and, and ears and noses or whatever until you give us what we want. And so they just said, okay, look, we'll, we'll give you, how much do you need every, uh, you know, what's reasonable amount for us to survive and for you to feel like that, that we're your vassals, we're, we're a tributary uh, of your kingdom. So, uh, this is the amount. And so they would have to give this gift of money every year to show their servitude. But this time, they used this opportunity to have direct access to the king as a strategy for war. So this is where, this is where we, we see it from a spiritual application in the New Testament era, is that we use this, this opportunity uh, to our advantage. You look for opportunities. You use the gift or the present as the tool to get you through the door and the access to the seat of authority. You don't start with a sword. You start with a gift. And this is so important for everyone that's watching today, for everyone that's connecting with us today, it is so important that the church has got to operate with this level of, of, of stealth, with this level of, uh, of focus, and with this clarity of what it is we're trying to get done. If it's just trying to kill people, well, you know what? You're going to get killed. If he just is going to attack the guard at the gate, guess what? It's going to take two minutes for there to be a company of, 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 that, of those Moabites that are going to descend upon him and his little dagger is not going to help him to last more than two minutes. They will, they will kill him in a second. And sometimes when people have no wisdom, they just go stirring up battles and they go fighting wars uh, that they're not, even, they're not equipped for. God didn't send them to do that. Uh, they're being foolish and, and they're going to be destroyed. They're going to just be whipped. You know, I've seen people try to take on demons or stir up, you know, witches or, you know, they're trying to fight, you know, people. You know, look, if God didn't send you, you're going to get whipped. You're going, you know, you're going to get messed up. It's like when Billy Cole went to, went to Thailand, his mom uh, looked at him and said, uh, Billy, uh, don't stir up any more demons than what you can cast out. <laughs> don't stir up any more demons than what you can handle. And so, so if you're going to deal with it, then just know, you know, uh, uh, when you start that battle, 
you better have a plan. And so God always has a plan. God always has a way of moving us uh, past the unnecessary things. And this is where we are strategic. This is where we are careful. This is where we, we show a, an, an element of compliance. I want you to listen to me carefully. We, we show a little bit of, of deference. Hey, I've got the gift that you've asked for. I'm giving you what you want. And then we use that as the opportunity to get us the access that we need to take out what we really want to take out. And so there are some, some battles that I'm not going to fight. I could, but if I do that, it may stop me before I get to what I really want to get accomplished. And so this is where wisdom comes in. This is where wisdom comes in. So the Bible says, And Ehud had made him a dagger, uh, two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. Well, I'm sorry. I said it was his left leg. It says it was his right thigh. But they would have chested him. They would have checked on the other side. I'm sorry. They would have checked the opposite uh, side. They would have checked the left because you would reach from your side to pull. You would reach from your side. You wouldn't, you wouldn't reach from your right side. You couldn't, couldn't pull it out. Are you going to pull it out from the same side that you, that you have it from? So, um, so they said he, he hit it on, his, on, the, on the leg that they wouldn't check. That was the whole point, on his right leg. And so he brought the present unto Eglon, uh, the king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. So the gift does what it's supposed to do. And once it, once it, it, it gets him to where the access is, now the gift moves out of the room and now something else moves in. So this is what we use the gifts of the spirit in our prayers is that the gifts of the spirit are the, are the things that lead us. The gifts of the spirit are what get us, shows us where the opportunities are. The gifts of the spirit gives us access. The gifts of the spirit get us through the door. The gifts of the spirit get us past all the lesser soldiers, uh, the lesser battles. The gifts of the spirit says, nope, don't mess with that. Nope, don't talk to them. No, it's, it's easier for you just to say, sure, no problem. What do you need? Uh, yep, yep, uh, yeah, sure, I'll sanitize. No, no problem. I'm not going to make you mad today. That's not, it's not a big issue. I, I just did it in the car, but you know what? I'll, I'll do it again if that will help you. Okay, uh, I, I'll flow with you right now because I'm going somewhere and I want to be able to have influence. I want to be able to be there at the time when it counts the most. I've got to be at my best. I've got to be at my best. And so God wants us to be, to, to be, I mean, one guy is going to turn the tide. If you are a skilled warrior and if you know what you're doing, one person in the spirit praying the prayer that God needs prayed in the right time, in the right place, can take out a whole network of the enemy, can wipe them out. I want you to know this one strategic strike killed a king and completely overturned uh, the, the oppression of the Moabites. There was another battle that was fought after he did this. There was a great war that was fought, but they took out the king. And when the king was dead, I mean, there was not much motivation left. And they drove them out of their cities. And so I'm telling you that God wants us to be strategic warriors. He wants us to operate in wisdom. He wants us to be in that flow. He wants us to flow and be our best. So this training and development that God is giving to us, he, he, look at this, verse 19, but when he himself turned again from the quarries that were in Gilgal, he said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And he said, keep silence. And all that stood by went out from him. Hey, it's a secret I need to tell you. Oh, oh, don't say it in front of my people. And so he used his arrogance. He used his pride. He used his sense of, of dominance and he flipped it on him by telling him it was a secret. And Ehud came to him and he was sitting in his summer parlor, which he had had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God. And he rose out of his seat and he stood up and, and, and Ehud put forth his left hand, the Bible says, and he took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft went, also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. All the corruption was exposed. The dirt came out. And Ehud went 
forth through the porch, shut the doors of the parlor and lock them. So now the parlor that was the seat of authority now became the place of his imprisonment and he flipped the entire environment and it was so it was so powerful and it was so exact and it was done with such wisdom that even the dagger that was used to take him out was not even seen. It was completely concealed. You talk about God using somebody. You talk about walking with effectiveness. This is, this is a warrior at his best. And I'm telling you that today, God is ready to raise up warriors that are gonna operate in the best levels, the highest levels. We're going to function with our, in our best uh, strategy, with our best minds, with, with our greatest confidence. I mean, to think about the restraint and the discipline that it took for him to do that, not to disclose anything, not to even give him a hint. If he's nervous at all, they might, they might uh, 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 look for more weapons. They might search him more thoroughly. If, if he comes across in the wrong manner, if he says the wrong word, but he was so exact, he was so perfect, he operated in such maturity that he was able to execute this and nobody even knew that he was there. When you and I operate in the spirit the way God wants us to, we can take things out and nobody even knows that we were the ones that did it. We come in and out of those environments. One strategic strike, Bam, and it's done. Brother Barnes used to tell me, he said, I can get more done in 10 minutes than most people can do in a year. Uh, and he was not saying that arrogantly. He was saying it actually with a, a certain amount of grief. Uh, it, but what he was saying is more people should be effective. That's what he was saying. I'm getting stuff done in 10 minutes. He said, but there's people that, that can't get it done in a year what I can get done in 10 minutes. And, and this should not be this way. There should be more people that are getting more things done. Imagine if we're all in this dimension together. Imagine, and this is part of what this broadcast is about. It's what this movement is about. It's what we're directing people into is that we want more and more people getting into that flow of the spirit where we are daily submitted to God. We are daily hearing God's voice. We are daily walking in wisdom where we are operating with all of these things that are available to us, all of the prophecies for the end time, all of the gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, the character of Christ, partakers of the divine nature, the seven dimensions of God, the seven spirits of God, the five keys of the deep, the keys of the kingdom, the weapons of our warfare, the angels, the people of God working together in unity, fivefold ministry. I mean, I could go on and on. We have to know this stuff. We have to flow in it and we have to be able to just knock out that adversary just like that. So God says, I left some adversaries there because I want every generation to be able to have mastery. I want them all to feel uh, that dependence upon me. And God says, I want them to be able to walk in that feeling of victory and exhilaration once they have been trained and developed. So God is, God is doing it right now. He's training us to be the best. He's training us to be the best. Verse 26, Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped unto Zareth. And it came to pass that when he had come, he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. And he said, follow me for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan before Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and full of valor. Don't you love these words? And there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel and the land had rest. So if we really want to win this, this is what it took. It, he didn't say, Let's marshal a bunch of men and disclose ourselves and go run to the Jordan and then go fight these 10,000 men. He says, no, let me go in by stealth and let me take out the king. And when we take out that king, then all of his infrastructure begins to fall. So we are taking out the princes and the powers. And when we take out these princes and powers, that's what Jesus did. He, had a, he, he took authority. He triumphed over the princes and the powers. And then all of those networks that are underneath them, these global networks, they all start caving in. You take Haman out and you put Mordecai in his stead, 
then all the laws that Haman passed and all the people that were in his corner, suddenly they lose their energy and things start to turn. So this is what we have to think. This is how we have to pray. God, show us the strategic seats that need to be removed. Show us what battles that you want us fighting. Show us how to penetrate into that place of influence and take out those powerful forces that have assembled these armies that are oppressing the people of God. Help us to know which cities are gonna tumble first, which pillars that are upholding or supporting this Antichrist system. And so these major cities are feeding the beast. That's what they are. And this is the reason why I believe that God is going to move in these alpha cities because as God moves through the alpha cities, it takes the infrastructure of hell away from it. It undercuts his power and everything that's feeding it. And so this is where what we're getting ready for. We're getting ready to move. And so God is gonna show us which cities are ready, which places that God is getting ready to move. He has been doing massive works, massive works in the earth in every generation. But I believe that he wants to do something specific in these last times, in this last decade, before things really go to, to that, that heightened intensity of persecution and, and extreme, uh, extreme resistance of the truth. I believe that this decade is our decade to make those strategic moves, to build those networks, to train the people. So we're going to establish training centers. We are going to uh, establish outlets, command posts for, for people that are ready to go to the next level to move effectively in the spirit. And yes, and yes, just as you, uh, the ancient book, The Art of War. So God has his own Art of War book and he wants to teach it to us. It's called, it's called the Bible. And so we're gonna, we're gonna learn from the word of God and we're going to be effective. So I wanna thank you uh, for, for just being in the flow with me on this today. And now I wanna pray some prayers about uh, the gifts of the spirit. I would like to pray these again over the body of Christ. I want us to pray it in two fashions. So let's go to a verse that we can use as our, as our um, faith. This will help our faith. You have to have a verse of scripture to support the prayer. So I showed you what uh, kind of the, the strategic warrior looks like again. We kind of got a refresher on that. Well, we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter number one. And um, I've got my old school, my old school Bible today. Um, so I, I, you can hear me rustling the pages today. I got this Bible when I was uh, 16 years old. And it is just, uh, it's my favorite Bible. It is, it's, it's everywhere. It's my my spine is all turned. This is my Greek Hebrew study Bible. This is where I first got an interest for these biblical languages. And my dad was just so, such a great example of, of hunger, searching out the scriptures. Now watch this. First Corinthians chapter number one. First Corinthians chapter number one. And he says, so I thank God, verse four, always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything, everyone say everything, you are enriched by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what he says. He says, I don't want you to come behind in any gift as we get ready for the coming of the Lord. So this shows us that the doctrine of secessionism is not true. Secessionists say that after the apostles died, there's no more gifts of the spirit and there's no more miracles. So 1 Corinthians 1 shows us the gifts of the Spirit go all the way to the coming of the Lord. And matter of fact, he says, I want you to become more gifted, that you come behind in no gift as you're waiting. In other words, that whatever gifts you've got operating now, there's more gifts than that. There's more ways to be used than how you're being used. And so as we get closer to the end, God wants us to be that much more effective. 11th hour, that one last hour, what was it? Why did he give him such a great blessing of giving a penny for the whole day's work when they only worked one hour. It's because they had to be the most effective. They had to have the most pressure. Uh, and so he gave them uh, the greatest reward. And so God is going to, for those that are willing to step into this harvest field, that are willing to step into this uh, this kingdom initiative and directive for an end time harvest and outpouring of the spirit of God. We're going to have to fight some, some battles. We're going to have to be vigilant. We're going to have to stay focused. We're going to have to have some strategies. We're going to have to build some things. Uh, it, it's going to be a lot. He says, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you the gifts that you need. I'm going to load you up 
And I, he said that you will come behind in no gift. Watch. That in everything, everything, you're enriched. In everything. In all utterance and in all knowledge. And this comes by the grace of God. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. So we're going to pray it three ways today. First, I'm going to pray it for you. I'm going to pray it for you individually. And I want you to pray it about yourself. And I want you to say, God, every gift that you want me to operate in, every, every dimension that you want me to access, everything that you want me to know, every way that you want me to be used, I want you to let it flow into my life. And I want you to claim it and confess it. And if you have personal prophecies over your life, that's the time. I want you to speak it and, and I want you to declare it. And then secondly, we're going to pray for our, uh, for our churches. We're going to pray for our local churches that God is going to help all of our local churches, and if you're a part of uh, Church Triumphant, I want you to pray for our church, that God will help every one of us come to our fullest potential and be used on the, uh, in our most effective way to be fruitful in his kingdom. And then the third way, the third thing we're going to pray is that there will be a global expression of this, that there will be a, a visible global church that will step into the collective the collective reality of all these local churches, these wise virgins coming through the open door and unsealing that end time anointing that has been reserved for these last days, that God will help us to come behind in no gift. And it will be greater and greater and greater uh, demonstrations of the Spirit of God. Does that make sense? All right, let's do it. Father, we're coming to you right now in the name of Jesus for every individual that's listening. I am praying, Father, as you have... Uh, commissioned me today to speak this. And that means that there is grace that is available. That means that you are ready, oh God, to fill in those gaps, that we would come behind in no gift. Now, I know that you were uh, speaking to the church at Corinth with Paul's words here, but I also know there was individuals in that church that had to have the fulfillment of that. And so, Lord, we want this for our churches, but we first need it for us as individuals. Help us to understand what is available to us. Help us to keep reaching up more into the all supply of heaven. Help us to keep accessing greater and greater levels of faith. Help us to flow, oh God, in those places, oh God, of hope, where hope, oh God, continues to speak more faith into us, where we see the strategy and we are future focused. And Father, I thank you that the gifts of the Spirit that flow out of your compassion, oh God, everything comes out of your love and out of your compassion, that that compassion will be in us so that all these gifts will be unhindered and that our motives will be pure. God, I pray as we get closer and closer to the end, oh God, that you would give us more access to the angelic, more access to clear directives, oh God, whether it's in prayer and a word from the Lord in our ear, or whether it's a vision that you show us, or whether it's a dream in the night, oh God, or whether it's prophets that you raise up, or great apostles, oh God, that are that are building uh, with, with clear uh, strategies. God, I pray that there would no, be no gift, that we would come behind in no gift in the name of Jesus for us individually now, I pray. Right now, God, for every person under the sound of my voice, I'm speaking that the gifts would be activated and the things that you are missing, that God will release it into your life right now. Moto ili makaya. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the discerning of spirits in Jesus' name. The gift of faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healing in Jesus' name. Diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. The gift of prophecy in Jesus' name right now. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise in Jesus' name. I want you to say, I am renewed in the promise. I am renewed in the promise I am who God says I am. I have what God says that I have. Now, I can tell you from my experience of being used in the gifts of the Spirit that there are times when we're really honed in and there's times when we know that the gift does operate, but we're not aware of it. I want you to notice in this chapter that we read in Judges that the gift got him there and then they took the gift away. The gifts will come and they will go. It's okay. But I want you to trust that the gift will be there when you need it. Now let's pray for our local churches. Would you do that? 
Church Triumphant family, I want you to pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are praying that we would read our, reach our full potential as a congregation, that the way the gifts of the Spirit work together, that the way the body of Christ is fitly joined, oh God, by, by that which every joint and every band supplies, oh God, eyes and ears and, 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 and oh God, hands and feet, Lord Jesus, hearts that beat and, and just all of the detail of the body, all of the complexity of the body coming together in perfect harmony. God, I pray that we would come to the full stature, that we would come to the full height of our potential. God, I don't believe that we have seen our, our greatest demonstration. I believe, God, that you are still honing that and still developing in it, but I pray, God, that we would be that church, oh God, of restoration. We would be that safe place for backsliders to return. We would be that place that, that people get the Holy Ghost so easily. We'd be that place where there is so much zeal that people are just eaten up with the kingdom of God and that they do not see and to teach and preach Jesus Christ, that in every home, oh God, there are prayer meetings and overflow and the gifts are operating and, and there's miracles and healings and signs and wonders. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would cause every ministry stream that you have, oh God, flowing in the body of Christ, that it would flow through us and that we would fulfill the destiny that you have for our local church in Jesus' name. For every church that is connecting out there all over the world, for every, whether it's a small house church or whether it, these are large networks, I am speaking the river of the Holy Ghost for the divine effectiveness that we would come behind in no gift, that we would be enriched in all utterance and in all knowledge, that we would walk, oh God, in the fullness of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I want us to pray that, that the cumulative, uh, cum cumulative, uh, cum I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say it, I can't get it to come out right. Uh, what culminates, uh, what accumulates, the, the accumulating prayers is the word I'm trying to get to. The accumulative uh, work of all of these churches that are becoming revived, coming together will create a transformation of the body of Christ around the world. And that what is seen on the global stage and what emerges on the global stage will be unlike anything that the world has seen in recent days. It will be greater than the latter rain movement. It will be greater than Azusa Street. It will be something that is greater than anything uh, that we have ever heard of. That's the vision of church triumphant. When God showed that to me, he said, that's the name of the church in the last days. And I'm letting you use that for your, you should be thankful, he said to me, that I'm letting you use that for your, for your local church. He said, because that's the name that I've given for my, for my church at the end of the age. It will be the church triumphant. Not a church triumphant in Pasadena, but the church triumphant. And we are going to see things that are greater than the book of Acts. So I want us to declare it. I want us to speak it. I quoted it to you yesterday. The, the early rain and the latter rain together so that we can have the harvest. Father, you as the caretaker of this garden, you as the one who is the, who is the vineyard keeper, Father, we are praying that you would pour out the rain, the former and the latter rain together. We are speaking that angels will be dispatched. Angels of miracles and healings will pass through the world, will pass through our churches, will pass through our cities and our nations. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that there would be an unprecedented wave, oh God, of not just people of prayer with humility and holiness and 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 uh and modesty god but but that they would be bold that they would be strong for you oh god that all of us together collectively will begin to see a movement that comes forth unlike anything that's ever been seen before a movement that is that's shown by your name a movement where your glory is revealed a movement where angels deliver people out of prisons a movement oh god where where there is great demonstration of your spirit out in the streets out in the fields oh god online in, in our homes, in our buildings, God, that everywhere, oh God, that we will triumph always and everywhere, and it will be a global outpouring, that there will not be any region of the world where there is not some great demonstration of the Spirit of God with power, that there will not be one corner, oh God, of this great, of this great uh, earth that you have made, oh God, that is not touched by the glory of the Lord, for you said the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas, 
You said, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh. And we are speaking, God, that you would cause those signs to follow the believers so that you can confirm this gospel, that you can confirm the word, oh God, that you can confirm the truth in the name of Jesus. I pray the river now. I pray the river now. The church will rise to its best, that we will be the best church that we can possibly be. We will be the best people that we can possibly be in these worst of times. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now we're gonna pray one more prayer today, and it's the beginning of our strategy of praying about what is going on in the governments of men. We're going to take, pray two prayers here for this as we close today. God told us to pray for all that were in authority, that we could live a quiet and peaceable life. So we're going to pray the first prayer um, around peace. In other words, that the church will continue to, to remain uh, in a protected place or in a, in a place of not being tampered with or messed with. And however God wants to do that, if he wants to keep us under the radar uh, and it just stays low profile, meanwhile, we're reaching millions of people, then I'm all for that. It doesn't have to be on the nightly news. Uh, I believe there will be a point when it will be impossible to hide it, but I am praying that God will help all of that infrastructure and grassroots revival to sweep through the world in such a way that it cannot be stopped. So we're just going to pray that the governments of men, just as God exchanged Haman for Mordecai, and then just as all those princes had to work with Haman, all of those princes had to suddenly work with Mordecai. And so I believe that God is going to give us that. That's still coming. That has not already happened. That's something that is still coming. So as we see a global network emerging, that is preparation for a global revival. The Great Reset leads to the Great Awakening. And that is the trick that is up God's sleeve, as it were. That's the strategy of heaven. And we see it, we see it in the word of God. And that's what we're going we're gonna to pray. But in the meantime, we're also going to pray that the strategies of hell will be reversed back against himself. That all of his devices and all of his corruption and all of the things that are evil, that as they have stood in the way of the church, that now suddenly their plans and strategies will be hindered. As Satan has hindered us, that suddenly now the tables will turn and we will be the greatest restraint and hindrance that all of these uh, wicked uh, people and their wicked environments and wicked movements and organizations that they have created, this spiritual wickedness in high places, that it will be stopped. It will be shut down. The rulers of the darkness Will be, uh, will, will, be, will, will be hindered and they will not be able to accomplish the will of God. Uh, they will not be able to accomplish the will of Satan, but instead we will be able to accomplish the will of God. Okay, are you ready to pray it? All right, let's do it together right now. In the name of Jesus, we come to you, God, as the people of God all around the world. We pray, God, in every nation, oh God, in every city, that every prince, oh God, will bow their knee to you. Lord Jesus, we pray that every government would submit itself we pray that every premier, oh God, every president, every, every Congress, every Senate, every parliament, oh, every form of governess, oh God, uh, uh, from the communists uh, and to the dictators, to the despots, to the theocrats in the Muslim world, to all of the supposed demo democratic environments that are more socialist in their, in their uh, leanings. Father, we are just praying right now. You said that we should pray for them, that we could live a quiet and peaceable life. So we are asking you, God, to restrain them, to, uh, to make them blind to the church, to make them blind, oh God, to this apostolic movement, to make them uh, not even see us as a threat at all, that we could be peaceable, oh God, and that we can do the will of God so we can have as many souls as possible to be saved. I pray secondly, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would disconfit them, stand in their way, hinder their wickedness, stop their strategies and plans. Let them fight amongst themselves, reverse their weapons back against themselves. Let them eat one another. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, let their swords be turned against each other. God, I pray that the pit that they have digged, let them fall in it. The net that they have spread, let them be trapped in it. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, reverse the enemy's weapons back against himself 
that your kingdom may come and that all the kingdoms of this world that arrogantly rise up against you may know that you are God and you sit forever in the heavens as king of kings. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your kingdom is coming and your will is being done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today for another uh, high noon prayer broadcast. Don't live in the shadows. Walk in the fullness of the light that is available to you. And may God bless you with his abundance in your life. We love you and we'll see you tomorrow.